Welcome to this edition of Great Books, a lively discussion of a selection from the canon of exceptional literature. Here's your host, Jack Hatfield. Welcome. Thanks for joining us for the Great Books Show. I'm Jack Hatfield. Our panel meets monthly to discuss great works of classic and modern literature. Today we're discussing an excerpt from The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. Jake will introduce this work. Jake? British-born Bertrand Russell is one of the great thinkers of the 20th century. Born in 1872, he was raised by free-thinking parents until their decease when Russell was eight. Russell was raised into adulthood by his father's more traditional parents. Bertrand Russell died in 1970. Russell studied mathematics and logic at Oxford University where he met Alfred North Whitehead. The two later collaborated on the logical classic Principia Mathematica. Along with mathematics and logic, philosophy and ethics were two other major Russell interests. Tonight we discuss three excerpts from his more philosophical writing of the first decade of the 20th century. They are summarized under the heading Philosophy and Knowledge. In these excerpts, Russell begins by taking up the questions related to truth and falsity. From these, he moves on to the questions of belief and knowledge. And finally, these prior discussions then form the basis for a consideration of questions relating to the value of philosophy. Thanks, Jake. Um, my first question is uh, a very broad one. Is according to Russell, what is truth? Does anyone want to take a shot at it? Well, he sort of defines it as a property of beliefs, that a belief can be true or it can be false. And for there to be truth, there has to be a philosophy where beliefs exist, right? But truth doesn't depend only on what one person believes. It has to correspond to some fact out in the outer world. But what didn't, okay. Anyone else? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? I think that's it. Is it possible to discern a fact out in the outer world or inner world? Like, how do you know something? Yes. Oh, well, he, he, he goes into a whole chapter on how you know things. Okay. And sometimes he says that only one person can discern a fact if it's a, a mental fact about how they feel. And he goes into a, a great big um, um, talk about one of Shakespeare's plays about whether two people <laughs> love each other and about... <laughs> How do you know whether that's true or not, that that person loves one, the other person? And it's that only the person doing the loving can decide whether that's true. However, there are other facts that everyone in the world is accessible to. But let me interrupt. <laughs> is, is what I was asking is kind of follow up. What you were describing at first is the correspondence theory of truth. Uh -huh. Okay. Is it possible to, for one person, anybody, to discern a fact, according to Russell? Is it just one of these worthless theories that you throw out and has no meaning? That's an interesting question. I'm not <coughs> sure that he ever actually addresses that. I mean, in terms of, in terms of the things in the, I mean, he talks about the past, um, for what Marine was talking about, was, uh, my understanding was, the degrees of certainty, that you can have absolute certainty when you have an intuitive knowledge of something by acquaintance, like Desdemona saying, she lo Desdemona loves Othello, the only person who can have an absolute certainty about that on the grounds of acquaintance is Desdemona. Everybody else's certainty is less than that. But in terms of whether you can actually discern a fact, I think he just simply takes it for granted that there's an outside world uh, I, I don't think he ever actually, unless I missed it, I don't think he ever actually addresses the issue of, A, are there facts, uh, are, are there statements of fact, are there just statements about the way things are, and can you discern that? Right. Can you discern that? I, I thought I, he did. I, I, he did says he the fact is a one-to-one -one correspondence. But you can't know it. It's I, a match. You can't ever know it completely because all facts are complex. There's no such thing as a simple fact. 
But he says that there are <clears throat> premises which you can know intuitively, and that's intuitive knowledge of something. And then there's derivative knowledge, and he defines that as derivative knowledge is what is validly validly deduced from premises known intuitively. Well, yeah, so he actually believes that you can know something, you can know facts. Oh, uh, whoa. There's only degrees of opinion for facts. Right. And he, also, he didn't define intuitive. No, I didn't think he said that. Yeah, I think he, he said there were degrees the, the of The fundamental thing, the facts. perception is acquaintance with something. Right. And you, whatever you experience that's outside of you, that's real. About that, at some point you begin to make judgments and construct beliefs about that complex of entities you're experiencing, and those can be either true or false, as you stated. I guess maybe it depends on what you mean by a fact. If you mean, is, are there states of affairs in the world, I don't, think he, I don't think he ever even addresses that issue. I think he simply assumes that there are states of affairs in the world. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of whether there's a core, whether we can, uh, the relationship of facts to truth is what he's talking about. I think he simply assumes that there are states of affairs in the world. I, I, let me... Because I, I, maybe I missed it. I just, let, let me bring up two, yeah, two yeah, points. Yeah, yeah, At the very <coughs> end, at page 154, I'm, I'm kind of taking part of this. He's <laughs> talking about something else, but he says... Um, uh, he's really saying... Uh, knowledge, if it's based on exclusive and personal point of view in a body whose sense organs distort as much as they reveal. So what I, I think he's getting at there is that you can't know anything outside because you can't see outside your own prejudice and all that sort of thing. And then on page 140, he says, if truth consists in a correspondence of thought with something outside thought, thought can never know when truth has been attained. I'm sorry, what? what, uh, what? One, 140. 140. <clears throat> truth consists in the correspondence of thought with something outside thought. Thought can never know when truth has been attained. You see it? It's in the last paragraph on 140. So what, but between those two, I think he's saying one is that, that we can never discern what is actually the other that we correspond, that thought corresponds to because it's one that's distorted by our personal biases and, and uh, all that. And the second is that uh, thought can't know anything outside thought. It can't know the, the thing in itself, as Count said. But he well, said I think he says you experience the thing in itself through acquaintance. And then you begin to make judgments about it. I mean, What's that's acquaintance? Acquaintance is perception, the perception of an, of an external reality, of objective reality out there, the not-self. Right, and he, I think he's saying it can't be done. He can approximate he, it, but it can't well, be done. Well, he says somewhere that, that if you're acquainted with something, that, that can't, you can't go beyond that. That's there, and it's, it's, if it's positive, it's, it's real and everything. You might <clears> misinterpret <throat> it with your beliefs and judgments about it. That's where error enters in. But he says his facts because the, there's a, a quote on page 147 that says, when a belief is true, there is a corresponding fact in which the several objects of the belief form a single complex. This belief is said to constitute knowledge of this fact. And the fact he's talking about here is he's talking about that, like, um, who was it? That loved who? Desdemona, Desdemona. Who loved uh, Othello. Yes. He says, yes, he Desdemona <laughs> loving and Othello are three facts, right? And that loving is a relationship between two of them. And that the word belief ties this into a fact. If there really is a fact, if Desdemona really does love Othello, then it, that fact exists. And the belief is true, and that's what truth is. But if there's no fact that she loves him, then it's an error. And the fact doesn't exist. But what, so he well, believes no, 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 that what fact, is the fact, fact, the fact is what we're trying the, to say. No, the fact doesn't exist. The complex fact doesn't exist that she loves him. Oh, if she it's, doesn't if love it's him. false. If the if belief, false. If the belief, if the belief is, is false. You can never no, talk about truth without falsehood. No, if the loving is false. The belief could be... Right. Somebody could believe that she loves him, but it can't be a true belief since there's no fact of her love for him. Right. And so the he, object, he goes into great 
detail about this subject, relation, object right. in a certain order, order. Mm -hmm. and that the belief ties it all together and makes it a fact. So I believe that's what he's calling Well, only if it's facts. a one-to-one -one match. I, What's a one-to-one -one match? I don't, I don't think he can be saying that, there are, that either there are no such things as facts or that we can't ever possibly get, get, get to them because then this whole thing is nonsense. Well, he does say on 147, <coughs> knowledge is not a precise conception. It merges into probable opinion. Right, right. No, that he does say. Yes, but, but, but that's not the that, same thing as saying that we can have no knowledge. And he's, saying, he's saying that there always, always has to be doubt in knowledge unless it's either right. self-evident or knowledge by acquaintance, you know, something like perception. Okay, what he says is there's two different ways, by a judgment, what by what's at 148. Is that we're all there, right at the top of the page. Yeah. Thus, in regard to any <clears throat> complex fact, there are theoretically two ways in which it may be known. He does say theoretically, by means of a judgment in which its several parts are judged to be related as they are in fact related. That's one. Or two, by means of acquaintance with the complex fact itself, which may in a large sense be called perception, though it is by no means confined to objects of the senses. So the way of acquaintance is the fundamental thing. Everything that is, uh, well, uh, knowledge can be true or false. And beliefs can be true or false. Acquaintance is what it is. That's the reality you're dealing with and making judgments about. That's, out of which everything that's else is correspondence. Constructed. We're back to the start. He just used that's right. a different word. That's right. Of course, that's all, that's all he ever says. But he says, says they are theoretically. That's, right. that's why I emphasize that, right. theoretically. But the acquaintance is through senses, correct? Well, perception. But mostly <clears throat> senses. It's at least senses. No, it says... Uh, Perception. Uh, perception, though it is by no means confined, confined to, to objects object of the senses. Of the senses. But, the senses, but it includes them. Like, right. for example, yes. the, the, like uh, Desdemona's acquaintance with her loving, uh, with her loving feelings, is is a form of acquaintance, but it's not with the per it's not with sensual perception. Yes. It's a right intuitive. But now, then sense. he goes on to say, <clears throat> the way of acquaintance is only possible when there is really such a fact, while the first way, like all judgments, is liable to error. You can't talk about truth without talking about falsehood because that's how you know where the truth is. Sure. And you have to assume non-contradiction to do logic. Sure. The second way gives us the complex whole and therefore is only possible when its parts do actually have that relation which makes them combine to form such a complex. Which means what? Well, he talks about it somewhere else. Oh. <laughs> He's starting to talk about coherence here. I mean, coherence, uh, you can have a... You can have several kinds of coherence. You can have two different theories, and they can be coherent, but one of them may not be true, or they both may be partially true. What about... Because coherence just means it's well-rounded and not internally contradictable. What about you, you uh, as, as you both, all three know, that you can, uh, the Earth is round or the Earth is flat, and you can prove both by uh, the interpretation of different sense... Uh, you could prove both? Yes. yes. I'd like to you... see you prove the earth is flat. <laughs> oh. you'd, have to, you'd have to meddle with the knowledge, with, the, uh, with all kinds of things. I mean, the, the theory about global warming, you know, there's two different theories. One says it's really happening, another says they're adding to it. Nobody really knows yet. Well, this is fighting a, over coherence. This is a little different. Uh, it's simple, you know, the earth is round. Uh, as you look out in the uh, horizon, well, you know, they say that the universe bends uh, space. So it's just simply bending space as we look out the Earth. And as we look from a satellite down, all we see is a flat, one-dimensional object. And it doesn't prove that the Earth is round. And there's, you can go on and on and prove that the Earth is flat. Anyway, that's... Well, I'm sorry, what, sorry, what was your point, Jack? The, the point was there's a, a case where, where you've got a, a fact in that you've got these... Uh, sense data is that, you know, the horizon you look out and it's round, or you, you can look down from space and see, see a round thing, but then you can come up with two different interpretations that are uh, uh, congruent. Both of them make sense by themselves. And so that's where... Uh, well, if you stay on page 148, he has a sentence. <clears throat> this sort of self-evidence is an absolute guarantee of truth. What does he mean by that, then? Yeah, what is it? 
He's in all cases where we know by acquaintance a complex fact consisting of certain terms in a certain relation. We say that the truth that these terms are so related has the first or absolute kind of self-evidence. And in these cases, the judgment that the terms are so related must be true. Okay, if going back to what uh, uh, Maureen was saying, that uh, about complex, I'm looking for the exact page, it's uh, if the two terms in that order are united by the relation into complex, the belief is true, if not it is false. What it seems to me is saying is if the uh, complex is true, the belief is true, which is meaningless to me. So I'm reading something wrong there. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. That was hard for me to... I think what he's talking about is <clears throat> if the complex exists as such in the outside world. That's what he's talking about. And then if, you're ju if, if the belief has the same... Uh, constituents of the complex uh, of the if the belief has the same constituents in the same order then it's true if they if it doesn't have the same constituents as in the outside world then it's not true so he's I, I'm not sure exactly why he I I'm not sure exactly why he broke it down into the I mean I sort of have a vague understanding why he why he thought it was necessary to analyze this in terms of object terms and object relations yeah, that was just thrown in I think yeah I, I, I couldn't quite get that, that. But I, th but I think what he's saying is that, the, is that the facts in the world exist as Desdemona. In the world, there's Desdemona, there's Cassio, and there's a relation of loving. Um, or like the cat is laying on the mat. You know, there's, there's the cat, there's the mat, and there's a relation of, of lying on the mat. Um, if, you, if that relation isn't, isn't tying those two things together in the real world, then a statement can't, then, it, then a statement saying that the cat is on the mat is, but has just, to be false. Again, it gets down to tautology. It's just saying, if it's true, it's true. No, he's, he's saying if, if you're, if, remember the truth is a, is a property of statements, right. not the outside world. Right. So, if the, so if the statements have the same constituents in the same order as they exist in the outside yeah, world, then it's true. I think that's what he was saying. Hmm. Yeah, I think he's saying <clears throat> if, if we don't have beliefs, if all we have is facts, then there's no falsehood. Right. Everything is true because facts are true. Physical facts. Right, physical facts. They're true. Uh, okay, they're Jake. Neither. They're just there. They're true. They're just J there. Jake's right. there, you know. <clears throat> and just, we all agree. Right? Yes. Okay. But he's talking about whether a belief is true. If the cat wasn't on the mat, well, then if I believed that the cat was on the mat, it would be a false belief. But if the cat really was on the mat, outside of me, the real world outside of me, if the cat really was on the mat, then I have a true belief. And, and that's the correspondence. Whoopee. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, but that's what, what, what he's he saying. He's trying to define what truth is. Yeah, but that's just... Uh, just uh, that he says you can't make up whether something is true just by thinking inside your mind. You we have know to relate that. it to outside. We know that. Okay. Well, and that, on page 144 where we're looking, he yeah. says, judging or believing is a certain complex unity of which a mind is a constituent. If the remaining constituents taken in the order which they have in the belief form a complex unity, that means if they're coherent, then the belief is true. If not, it is false. You know, he, he says that uh, uh, coherence is, is a test and a criteria, but it, it's not right. the whole thing. You first have to have this intuition, too. There has to be something that, that acquaintance is something but you don't get to choose. That one thing, I, I, last I'll bring it up, is he's saying if two terms in the belief are united by relation into a complex, the belief is true. Where are you looking, Jack? Yeah. That's an, but that's an example. But that's if they're united. They might not be united. Well, you could say the, the, you could say the cat's on the rug and it can be true or false. In both cases, that complex is United. No, and it's not, not a true fact if the cat isn't on the mat. But that's not today what he's saying here. Yes, he's saying. Cause yes, it he, is. He says, if there's a complex unity, and here's the example he gives, Desdemona's love for Cassio. If Desdemona really does love Cassio, then there's this fact of her love for Cassio, but and he, it exists. He, well, anyway. Right? He's, I, th I think what, what confused me was that, was that he was talking about complex unities um, in both 
both as properties of beliefs and as properties of the real world. And that's, and he didn't adequately, I, I mean, you, you guys obviously understood that. I didn't understand that originally. And okay. I was getting confused with it because, because when he's talking about complex unities, I thought at first he was only referring to terms in a statement. And, mm -hmm. and clearly no, he is no, returning. No. But no, no, he's not. He's, re, he's, he's, well, he is, he's referring to that. Yeah, but, but he's also referring yeah. to the complex, he's also referring to the facts in the world, that that's the complex unit. Yeah. And the facts true. in the world are more basic. <clears throat> What's that? The facts in the world are more basic. Are more basic, right. Well, in, in my career, they're real. The others may or may not be. Is is kind of the true test, or the, the best test of knowledge is intuitive knowledge, and he doesn't define intuitive knowledge. Is that correct? Right, he doesn't define. Okay. It. Well, he calls it. Although acquaintance. he does. Although he's, it's one form of knowledge by acquaintance. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so <laughs> after I I took too much of her time, and something I still would argue that uh, we're coming to the end of the time. So sure. what? What did you get out of this? Um, I, I have to say that my reaction to this was a little bit like yours. Uh, I, what, I, what I'm taking, I'm inferring yours to be. Um, I understood his desire to clarify the concept of truth in such a way as to make it philosophically rigorous. And so that maybe, I mean, we don't have the whole, I mean, this, we don't have the whole thing, obviously. So maybe this was a prelude to further ex, you know to, to, to right. further uh, you know clarifications of other issues once you have this thing clarified I mean I I sort of appreciate it that that might be the, the case but it seemed to me like a lot of it seemed like much ado about nothing I mean I, I just <laughs> had the sense I just had the sense that he was telling us stuff which probably means I don't really understand it you know yeah, that's, that's always that's always the first thing is you don't really understand it's it if you think if it, right if you think that it's much ado about nothing somebody who's obviously as bright as, as Bertrand Russell considerably brighter than me if I think it's much ado about nothing I probably don't understand it okay. but that was my first okay. response Jake? <clears throat> well the value of the value of philosophy is that it uh, we should study it for the sake of the questions themselves because these questions enlarge our conception of what is possible, enrich our intellectual imagination, and diminish the dogmatic assurance which closes the mind against speculation. But, above all, through the greatness of the universe which philosophy contemplates, the mind also is rendered great and becomes capable of that union with the universe which constitutes its highest good. Right. We, we get a little piece of infinity is what he says. It's just very religious to me. Okay. <laughs> I, I like the fact that he, he spent two chapters here talking about what's true, and then he says the value of philosophy is that it asks all these questions, none of which answers can be definitive. You know, yeah. tr true. <clears throat> you know, right. And he loves it because you can't have a definitive answer to any really philosophical question. Yeah, but there I was hoping we could spend a little bit more there time on that opinions. part of it because yeah. that was really, me I thought that was, that that was I interesting. Understood. Yeah, that part I got too. <laughs> well, you didn't I understand got part. the first part, you don't understand that part. <laughs> oh, Maybe I, I guess, I, guess I don't I understand don't so. it. It is, uh, yeah, I, I think it's necessary to but get the first part. I think there's this. a lot missing because I certainly don't think I'm smarter than, than Russell, but <laughs> I thought a lot of what he was saying was very incomplete and not well, that might be his redactors. <laughs> He's also I, the other thing I thought was that um, this was it wasn't it wasn't um, um, because of any difficulty that he had in writing. I think he was a wonderful writer. I oh, think he was clear. I think I, I thought I thought it was as clear as you can be, but I didn't just didn't think. I thought he was logical the way he explained his arguments. Yeah. Okay. And w which is why I was surprised at the end when he said, this is the value of philosophy, that uh, we just ask questions, we can't prove the answers. I, I, my takeaway from it, when he said that uh, you, can only ha you can't have true knowledge, you can only have, what, probable? probable. Uh, yeah, probable. Well, but some of it's high probability for your about. time and place, yeah, sufficient right. to act. And it's useful. It's you know good enough for government work and br building bridges. <laughs> I hope it's better than that. And, and uh, <laughs> delivering bridges. the mail. But um, I thought that was interesting. After all of that talk, he just says, and that's kind of my takeaway. And I, it's I think it's valuable to know is that uh, that truth is never a hundred percent. He thinks he thinks that there are some things that you can know with absolute certitude. But on the other hand, they're relatively trivial. I mean, they're absolutely fun, foundational, but they're also relatively trivial. I mean, you could know that the truths of logic are with absolute certainty. He thinks. Um, yeah, you could, if you accept, <clears throat> yeah, right. If you accept non-contradiction. Uh, right. If you accept non-contradiction. I mean, yeah. But he says there are certain things you can know with certainty, so they're foundational. 
but they're trivial in a sense. They don't give you any of the answers about these, the kinds of things that he's talking about at the end that, that, you were, that you were saying have no definitive answer to the philosophy. It's not philosophy's job to provide a definitive answer to those things. But, he, but we're, en we're enlarging the soul is what we're doing. That's, the purpose that's what of he's life saying. is to enlarge the soul. It's to enlarge the soul. And right. I wouldn't use the word soul, but enlarge our Well, I, 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 I might have made, made up that things. word. I don't know. To look at new things. Oh, it's good. Is it, is it in there? Mind is rendered great, he said. Yeah. yeah. The mind is, and I understand that part. But he, he also said that, like, science has inventions that affect other people. But philosophy really only affects the person who studies it. And I disagree because ideas like freedom and liberty and democracy, they've changed our world and they all come from philosophy. Well, I don't think he, I don't think he means that necessarily. But I mean, if you, he's trying to say if you study philosophy, you'll be helped. And everybody's a philosopher. No, I mean, he says there's some practical men who well, don't ask questions. Well, that's how they are there to be derided. It's just because he's mad at those people who wouldn't pick it with him when he wanted to stop the wars and all that stuff. I mean, nobody, everybody philosophizes to a certain extent. It's just very limited and narrow. Mm -hmm. You know, he says that we are at everybody, whether they know it or not, is in touch with objective reality, and it's how you interpret it. And if you're really dumb, you just don't spend time learning what philosophy can teach you. Yeah, but he says, if the study of philosophy has any value at all for others and students of philosophy, it must be only indirectly through its effects upon the lives of those who study it. Okay. Yeah. So we're the, uh, thank you. I, I, he sure affected my studies of mathematics. I couldn't read that darn long. <laughs> I think philosophers changed so the world. All. Of course they, they did. did. Yes. This guy improved on Hume. Is what he was trying to do, I think. I, I think he did. I think so, too. He, Made a lot more sense. He had, to me. Well, he had the same problem. Human. I'd be interested in. I mean, I know he was he was an atheist, and relatively militant. Agnostic. Well, agnostic. Relatively militant agnostic. Um, they talked in the introduction about this mystical illumination he had. Yeah. Did you yes. read that thing? No. In the introduction, I he had, he had a then. mystical illumination, and I'd be and I'd be really interested in understanding what that was. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. Join us next time as we discuss another great selection. As Aristotle said, the best way to learn is to get together in small groups and discuss great ideas.